because it's just made into order place. <laughs> Oh, Joe Crane, would you raise some prayer, please? Yes. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this day that you've blessed us with. Thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy toward us as a people. Thank you, Father, for this tribe that we serve and our leaders. Ask, Father, that you'd bless our chief, the administration, be with our chairperson today and each member here. Give us knowledge that we might do good work for the people we represent. Father, I pray for our soldiers and those that are standing in harm's way today. Uh, watch over them and protect them, Father, and bring them home if it be thy will soon. Go with us now and help us make good decisions for our people. Forgive us where we fail you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Be <coughs> Roll call, please. Curtis Sam? Here. Chris Soap? Here. Bill Anglin? Here. Bill John Baker? Here. Jack Baker? Here. Harley Bozer? Here. Julia Coates? Here. Bradley Cobb? Bonnie. Joe Crittenden? Here. Jody Fishinghop? Here. Meredith Braley? Here. Janelle Fulbright? Here. Vaughn Barvin? Here. Chuck Hoskin Jr.? Here. Hannah Glory Jordan? Present. David Thornton? Eric Allen Watt, uh -huh. John Masters. Who? We have a form. I'd like approval for the October 15th regular session meeting. I move to be approved. Second. All in favor, aye. Aye. All the same side. Passes. I'd like approval of minutes for the October 16th special meeting. Hold on. Hold on. Hold Second. You want to get a vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Let's go down to the uh, reports. Uh, Natural Resources, Linda Drews, Angela Drews. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Um, I have an extremely short report for you. Um, I wanted to let you know that uh, we did have our meeting with uh, the folks from Cherokee, North Carolina that uh, come down to meet with us regarding um, some seeds. It was a seed exchange that we had with them. As you know, one of our balanced scorecard measures for 08, there's two different ones. One is ethnobotany, and the goal was for us to have 75 culturally identified plants in our Cherokee database. And the other goal was to have 10 culturally identified plants in our seed bank. Um, we now have 49 plants identified and the research done on those so we're really ahead of schedule on that goal and after our meeting we now have 12 culturally identified plants in our seed bank and of those 12 three varieties of original Cherokee North Carolina flower corn um, is in those seeds and um, we have uh, got a meeting coming up very shortly with um, a gentleman that's known as the corn man and some of you may have heard of him before but he also has uh, quite a collection of seeds that we are also hoping to get for our seed bank so um, as we uh, progress with that project I'll keep you posted or if you ever want additional information on that you're more than welcome to uh, come and see us um, we did close on um, another piece of property this month. Um, next month we will be bringing to you a presentation at your meeting of all of the tribal land acquisitions. We were going to do that for you today, but the agenda was pretty full, so I believe we're just going to do that for you next month. So hopefully we'll have a little more time to go through that presentation. And that's all I have for today. Do I have a question, Harley? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> 
Angela, the last uh, meeting that we had, we were going to work on a plan for, from that portrait. Has it been submitted? I know he could have been having done about 10 days. Yes, he did submit it. Could I get a copy or could you provide me a copy? Of that sure. Copy? And can you elaborate just a little bit on what was said about the fine, fine? Actually, he brought it to us on Friday, Harley, and um, I've only just scratched the surface of it. Um, but it does talk about there are some plans in there for when we could look to harvest some of the pines. It does have some information written in there about um, when we can do controlled burns, when we can do thinning. When It's going to give us a lot more leeway. Could, could I get a copy of the plan? Sure. Okay, I'll be fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Have any more questions? And, uh, yes, ma'am. Could you get me a copy of the seeds that you have already collected? <coughs> please? Sure. <coughs> and the plants also. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Would you check in and see what if there is any type of a pine crop out at South Soil Creek Park? For the White Mission, you know, the White Mission over there, South. Mm -hmm. Did you say pine crop? Yes. Yeah. I think we've already got the study on that, so I'll forward it to you. Okay, I'm not. Mm -hmm. I think we asked for it before, but I didn't get the study. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. We'll get it to you. It's been a year or two. Okay. Okay. Do you have any more questions for Angela? Thank you. <coughs> Real Estate Services, Linda Dawson. Good afternoon. I think you probably saw my report in the packet was a little bit short, but I had I was gone last uh, uh, the week before to uh, Wisconsin where we went to an Indian Land Working Group to find out more information about what is the, in the uh, future plans for fee to trust and uh, we're still up in the air because they can't decide whether they're going to do negotiated rulemakings or just give us some codes and uh, so we're still trying to find out more information on which direction that uh, the BIA is going to go with that so uh, uh, I'll probably have my uh, information on the uh, report next month as to our scorecard so you'll see more of what is going to be happening with real estate real estate services for this year. Um, also, uh, we did receive and return uh, approximately 863 phone calls. We met with 89 individual clients. We completed 30 site inspection. We did two ALJ airships and submitted these to BIA. We had seven hunting leases submitted to the Bureau last month. One hunting lease has been approved by the Bureau. We did five home visits, two rights of entries, which are those rights of entries are allowing persons to cross restricted or trust lands to either uh, do electrical services or to do a... a uh, sewer and uh, water. So uh, we also had four jurisdictional calls for the uh, Marshal Service. <coughs> two quiet titles were handled. Actually that's not two quiet, well, two quiet titles were handled. We actually did seven, but some of those are going to be on for this, this month's uh, list. We did one will interview and we also had one full blood will approved in court. And uh, I guess that's my report. Councilman Cobb? Uh, I uh, 
am I to understand that we're still waiting on traffic report for the proposed remote casino for the BIA? We have received that report, and um, the environmental group that is putting it together, they have it, and they are finishing that up. We have also drafted a lease that has gone to the attorney for CNE, and he's looking that over. We also have um, uh, received the the uh, appraisal that the uh, appraiser service is fixing, and we've sent that up to the office of the special trustee a review appraiser to go over. Once we have all of these components back and are together, we're ready to submit to the family for uh, their signing. <coughs> okay. So that's basically where we are. Ms. Gordon? Were you able to get with Mr. Sutherland to get a uh, list or a number of the number of houses that are going to come out in the next couple of years, payoffs on restricted property or trust property? Trust property? Yeah. Not yet, but I am. Um, got that in the works. And have we got anything done on my little lady at Fall City? Did she, she call? She called. She called them? We still don't have anything okay. done. Um, I talked to one of the attorneys, but I hadn't heard what's happened, so I will check on that again to see where it is. Okay. I'm about to think that they can just send it back to me and I'll just do it. Well, I think between me and you, we could probably do it <laughs> and, get it, and have it done by now. Yeah, we could. Have had it done by I'm, I'm about at that point too, Tina. Where if it you needs to. Out, I appreciate it. Okay. She's very patient, but. But we need to get her done. Okay. Okay. Any questions, Councilman Cobb? Would it be possible to get a real short list of what you just told me okay. um, emailed to me? Your email is just the uh, Bradley Cobb. Bradley dash Cobb at your get over. Um, just the who the different departments we're waiting on attorney for C and E. Okay. Okay. We're and okay. And you okay. I'll get that for you. As long as I have it by the twentieth of November, that'd be great. Okay. I I can get that out to you this week. Thank you. Anything else? Anything else, Mr. Nelson? Thank you. Thank you. Roads and Transportation, Michael Lynn. Good afternoon. I'm going to keep my uh, report as brief as possible, too. I know we've got a full agenda today. <coughs> Just mention the projects that we've got currently under construction. Uh, first one here is Fairview Uchi 2 up in Delaware County. I think that's going to be completed here, uh, completely finished within the next uh, 10 to 15 days. We've got a final punch list that we've put together with some, some minor items on them that uh, need to be fixed or repaired prior to closing it out, but we're looking to close that one out definitely within the next month, but the contractor will probably be moving off site here just any time. Uh, Red Barn Road here in Cherokee County, uh, they're installing some underground storm drain. Uh, bringing the subgrade up to plan elevation on that project. I know I've reported in the past we've had some utility issues out there. Those have been resolved and a letter was sent to the contractor uh, letting, letting him know that he can go ahead and proceed on uh, as normal. Uh, those utilities should be out of the way and relocated. Uh, Daytown Dry Creek job up in Delaware County. Uh, they are, it's, they're, have separated that into three phases. The first phase, they told me this morning, should be ha have some asphalt out on the first phase. That's from a uh, uh, town of Little Kansas headed north uh, towards the Kenwood Road. Uh, they should have some asphalt out there hopefully tomorrow, if not by this, uh, the end of this week, and uh, start getting asphalt down on that. Uh, they're constructing some pedestrian bridges, two pedestrian bridges uh, for uh, uh, pedestrian access that uh, runs parallel to the road. Uh, the beams have been set in place on those and they're uh, uh, still under construction. Uh, and then the rest of the project, they're just doing some clearing, grabbing, and bringing, bringing the subgrade up to uh, elevation. And lastly, I want to mention the Barber Road here in Cherokee County. That's a, a job I've mentioned in the past that we're uh, pushing to get through as uh, right of way acquisition as quickly as possible and, and, and the design so that it can uh, 
work in conjunction with a water line or project that community services has planned to go down that project that road and we certainly don't want them to have put a water line down that road and us come in and widen the road in, in the future so we're working together on that project to try to get it done around the same time uh, we've hired a, a few new staff members uh, we've replaced two staff members a roads project analyst uh, kind of also a uh, that person also wears kind of a GIS type hat um, and Philip Manus is his name uh, surveyor one a uh, guy by the name of Lynn Trammell has taken that position and then uh, we've had two part two uh, new staff members start today a uh, project inspector named uh, John Jordan and a Rose Lab technician named uh, Mitchell Cisco. So those those are four new staff members that we've had start here recently. Uh, don't have any, uh, haven't received any requests for any uh, tribal funded projects this month, so I don't have anything to report on those, and that uh, is all I had to report today. Other questions, Mr. Buffer. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I was going to ask the road program to to give us a report on transit. Transit was brought up about two years ago here in Cherokee Nation, and I understand that we have a twenty-five thousand dollar grant to study some of the transit issues. I know it's a long; it would be a long discussion for Michael to go through that today. But what I'd like to make this in the form of a motion to have a special meeting next month, right after. Our Tuesday's meeting, which will be, I think, December the 11th at 2 p.m. Because I think we have the Education Committee at 1 o'clock, and I'd like to uh, put this in form of motion to have a special meeting at 2 o'clock to discuss transit. As most of you know, gasoline is over three dollars a gallon now, and probably going to be four dollars at the time we get around this time next year. It's not that. Uh, you know, maybe transit doesn't need to go into the roads program, but I'd like for the tribal council members to hear what uh, the roads program have done in the last uh, year to 18 months on the study. So there was a survey out, and, and I'd like for Michael or the roads program or community service to come up and present that to you. If you would. I'd make that inform the motion. Second. Yes, second. We have a discussion on this. All, all vote yes, yes. Aye. 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 Oh, same sign. Thank you. Any more questions for Michael? Oh, Michael, thank you. Thank you, guys. Construction of facilities report. David Roberts. Good afternoon. Um, a couple of things that are going on. Uh, we have quite a bit of construction going on. My name is Todd Enlow, not David Roberts. Uh, the immersion classroom, uh, which is the old casino structures uh, that has been moved near the Child Development Center, should be completed by the end of November uh, as far as the interior. We're starting the water and sewer hookups this week with Tahlequah Public Works, so we should have that space available for the immersion classroom in the month of December. I don't think that they plan on moving into that until probably the spring semester, um, but uh, I think you guys have a tour and we uh, plan to have you guys go through that facility. Uh, I believe your tour would go through around November 29th, so it should be available and ready for that. Uh, vocational rehabilitation, which is located in the motel adjacent to the tax commission. Uh, we are renovating some space and moving them closer to the <coughs> Veterans Affairs Office. And they will be moving in the next uh, seven to ten days. Uh, we're pouring sidewalks and uh, uh, finish up the re rehab of the space to make the space uh, wheelchair accessible. Um, and then immediately after that, the tax commission will move into the previous space. They're not moving offices. They're just spreading out a little bit more. Um, and then as finally, as far as space is concerned, the housing rehab office space should be finished by the end of November as well. And that is just to the west of the casino here in Tahlequah, which allows them office space, storage, as well as uh, some cabinet and construction material storage. I um, want to touch briefly. Uh, Angie mentioned that we closed on our property in Tahlequah. That was Dotson Roberts Lumber Company, uh, located just to the east of the 
uh, Capitol building. Uh, we actually acquired two separate lots with that, or three separate lots with that, and um, we are conducting an inventory inside the facility now uh, to determine what materials are in there. We've also been working with <coughs> Housing Rehab and Community Services to reuse, it, reuse those materials in several of the housing projects as well as facilities. So uh, not only did we pick up the property, we also picked up the inventory in there as well. So it helps subsidize some of our services out there. Um, and I believe that, oh, the powwow grounds, the bid project uh, package that went out a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had to pull that back out because of uh, employee oversight and we should get that released by the end of this week. Uh, we're working, continue to work with uh, community services, water and sanitation, uh, but the employee had accidentally left off some footage on some of it and we had lots of erroneous questions, so we're pulling that back so the um, bidders have the correct information. And that's all I've got. You guys have any questions? Any questions for Todd? <coughs> all right, thank, thank you. Sir. go to old business, discussion of the landfill issues and ICI contract performance. Uh, call on Brad Carson, please. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> My presentation will be necessarily brief, and it will start with a couple of housekeeping matters, if I could. When I was here last, um, about a month ago, I did promise that I would deliver to the council um, a discussion of the environmental issues surrounding the, uh, the landfill and the testing that had been done, a summary of those tests. And I did prepare those. And so, Councilman, if I could convince you to pass those around, and everyone can take those. This is a summary of the various reports throughout recent history of the landfill from A&M Engineering that has been commissioned to do that work and does it on a quarterly basis at the landfill um, and has done that for um, several years now. And you'll see they have a discussion that gets rather technical as you go toward the back and they have a number of summary charts and graphs but it also has an um, executive summary at the beginning in the form of a letter where it discusses um, Thank you, Doug. Um, where it discusses the environmental issues surrounding the landfill and concludes that after thorough testing, there is no environmental damage as a result of the operations of the landfill. So I would invite you to take a look at that, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have about that, or be, um, if it's a technical matter, I can get uh, greater expertise to bear on this problem as well. Um, my conclusions today are not much different than those suggested to you when I was here a month ago, which are that to close the landfill, and we've had three separate engineering companies look at it, as well as another group that has considerable expertise in the landfill, that closure of the site would cost between 12 and $22 million today. Those expenses are largely because we're changing plans midstream. The way the waste has been accumulated has been with the expectation that the landfill would have a lifespan of anywhere from 20 to 50 more years. And so to, to make the decision to close the landfill today would be a rather radical change in plans and to make it then suitable for closure would require some preparatory work that escalates the cost up substantially. Again, from 12 to $22 million, depending on how um, some of those long-standing matters are not environmental issues today, but they would have to be dealt with in preparation for closing, how they were to be handled. So what do we do with the landfill if the council and Chief Smith decide that 12 to $22 million is more than they would choose to close the landfill? Well, there's really a couple of options. Um, one is that we could simply run a transfer station at the site where people collect the trash and were to locate that trash at a, uh, another landfill. There is a dearth of landfills in the region, of course. Muskogee, Salisaw, and Tontytown over in Arkansas are the uh, likely um, recipients of any transfer station waste that we were to collect. Alternatively, we could choose to reopen the landfill, and that presents two options as well. We could run the landfill ourselves internally, or we could outsource management to a third-party firm that had some expertise in that. Those are all difficult decisions to be reached, 
and um, I certainly have my own views about what the best approach is, um, and I know many people on the council do as well. There are lots of attendant issues to this, in addition to the economic ones involving litigation, involving the status of contracts with the city of Fayetteville, um, with the future business plans, and some of those things are frankly matters that perhaps would be better discussed outside this particular public hearing. I, of course, will be here through the council meeting tonight, so if people would like to chat in the interim or after the council meeting tonight, I could certainly do that. Um, operation of a landfill is typically quite profitable. The major expenses are up front in the forms of major capital. The operating expenses for landfills, experts say, are usually cents on the ton at a time when the so-called tipping fees can range from $15 to $40 a ton at a various landfill. So you can see that on an operating basis, landfills can be quite profitable. I have no doubt that the Cherokee Nation, um, with the best minds approaching the issue, could run the landfill. As Councilman Baker has admonished me in the past, I'm not going to make any exorbitant promises about the profitability of a landfill were we to run it. I would just simply say that one should be keenly aware of what the closure costs of a landfill are going to be because 12 to $22 million up front is a very expensive price tag. And so from a purely financial perspective, and I would note that there are many considerations beyond the merely financial, but from a purely financial perspective, it would suggest that getting the landfill going where it's generating revenue, revenue that can be devoted toward a closure fund that will allow us when we choose to so do um, or when the landfill runs the course of its life, that we will have the funds there to close it and we won't be faced with the dilemma that we do today. Um, so with that, I would be happy to answer questions from the council that you might have. I know many of you have um, lots of matters that uh, bear on your mind. Thank you, Councillor, for, uh, for your kind introduction, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Have any questions? Right. Councilman Harlan. So, uh, yeah, where, where are we right now in the process? Where does it stand? Uh, what are we doing? Well, there's a couple of things that have to happen. Um, I am not capable myself of uh, saying that CNB, which I operate, can take over the landfill. That's a board decision that I report to, and of course the nation itself must decide who owns the landfill um, to transfer it underneath our jurisdiction. That would be my recommendation, however, that we take over and we make the decisions um, on an ongoing basis. We have access to capital, we have access to the resources to make this um, decision both quickly and, I think, in the right way. Um, we are in a bit of a holding pattern right now as we get the will of the council, of Chief Smith, and of course of our board, too, which meets later in the month and the landfill will certainly be a, a matter of uh, discussion. So right now we're just trying to keep a, a lid on the problem. And um, uh, hopefully within the next couple of weeks we can make a decision about who runs this and what direction the person who runs it will take. Todd, Embry? Yes, uh, and this goes to keeping the lid on the problem. Uh, what is the uh, status of uh, our compliance uh, with the city of federal contract and how much is that costing the nation uh, in, in dollars, let's say, per, per week? Um, we are compliant with the city of Fayetteville contract. The city of Fayetteville has some concerns, however, about that. As I mentioned when I was here last month, the city of Fayetteville was using its compactors to actually deliver trash to the Taunty Town landfill run by waste management. We had negotiated prices both with Fayetteville for that transportation and with Taunty Town and waste management, just oral agreements with them. The, as I mentioned then too, as we move into the winter months, Fayetteville's continued transportation of that um, is not a workable solution from there. And the compactors are not capable of traversing muddy, snowy roads. It puts a lot of wear and tear on them. It was a short-term solution. And so we are now moving into a situation where the city of Fayetteville, um, notifying of this, has <coughs> put out for bid short-haul transportation from uh, the transfer station there to Taunty Town and will deduct from the amount they're paying us, the 2450 roughly, the cost of that change. I don't know an exact per week cost to us of that, but roughly they're doing 250 tons a week and I would estimate the transportation costs could be you know, six to nine dollars. And so you can see that there's going to be on a going forward basis you know, a greater cost associated with the Fayetteville contract's compliance than there has been uh, that I represented last month of what it was. 
multiple questions. How much are we losing now? Not counting what we're going to lose on the short, the short haul. How much are we losing on a daily basis from the Fayetteville contract? How much is the tribe losing? Well, as I reported last month, the notion was that we would lose about $750 a day or so. Let me strike that. That isn't quite the right numbers. And Callie may help me here. The deal I had talked to Gary Dumas about, the city manager of Fayetteville last month, was they would continue to charge us. They would charge us rather $3 to transport it. We would make $24.47 a ton in revenue, and then we would pay Tawny Town a similar sum to that. And that added up to about $750 a day. So going forward, I think the losses will be probably triple that on a daily basis. It would be a rough estimate. Callie, do you want to give us some specific numbers on that? I was just going to say what the assumption we're working on right now is the deal that Brad worked out last month, which is about $650 to $700 per day. And that's what we are billing. We're billing at the contract rate and have not received any chargebacks from Fayetteville yet. And we don't know what that charge will be, but we're estimating, and it is just that, that the daily hauling costs could be $6 to $9 a ton. So by adhering to the contract, it's questionable who signed it for the tribal under what authority. We're going to start losing upwards of maybe a couple thousand dollars a day? I think that's entirely possible. And all we have up, if we don't adhere to the contract, is a $100,000 bond of some sort and feather hauling equipment? Well, I guess two things you raised there. The money for the bond is, by all indications and all investigation, not our money. It was put up apparently by ICI, but that's a matter of some dispute between the various parties. And so it isn't necessarily our money that would be lost in that particular effort. Okay. Let me understand, Brad. We can pay upwards of $2,000 a day, a continuing loss, a continuing drain from our tribal money, or we can just let them have ICI's $100,000 in feather hauling equipment and go home. Or I think it is, with all due respect, as you know better than I do, as a practicing lawyer than I am a former one, I mean, we do open ourselves up to possible contractual liability. That's a question of litigation. If we've waived our sovereign unity. Again, that's the subject for litigation, right, exactly. I think the larger question from a business standpoint, let me address that, because, again, you know the issues about principal agent law and sovereign unity better than I do, is this. For the landfill to be viable over the long haul, for us to generate the funds necessary to close the landfill over the long haul without sticking the nation with a $12, $20 million charge right up front, we have to have the business from northwest Arkansas. That is an essential part of making that particular model work, and it's really the only model for the landfill. So abrogating the Fayetteville contract, even let us assume for the sake of argument that we have the right to do so, would do two things. One is we need the Fayetteville trash over the long haul for the landfill and for the multi-year relationship. A deficit in the short term, I think, could be justified by the long-term benefits. And second, it will make it, I think, much more difficult to acquire the business in northwest Arkansas and in Oklahoma, for that matter, that will be needed. No one would ever sign a contract with us where we didn't have an explicit waiver of sovereign immunity, and they would need other built-in protections. So that's the concern about that from a business standpoint. We need the trash if we're going to reopen. Yes. But it hadn't been decided whether we're going to reopen. From a financial perspective, the recommendation is that it makes more sense to reopen than not. I mean, your alternatives are reopening or $12 to $20 million. A middle ground of that, one that is only probably is the worst of all worlds, would perhaps be running a transfer station there where you might generate some revenue but not enough to deal with the long-term closure issues. And under federal environmental guidelines, as soon as you stop using the landfill, a closure requirement starts immediately. So that $12 to $20 million will come in before the spring hits us. Okay. When you reviewed all the history of the landfill, 
Historically, what was the landfill open for? Historically, before ICI came in, it was basically for local usage. For four counties, local trash, and that's all it was to be used for. <coughs> yes, I think that's a fair statement. At what point did we decide we wanted to try to make a business out of it where it made money? Um, I can't tell you the exact point. It appears from just looking at the record, and some people in this room were present at the creation of this. Um, I would say that the landfill was losing money, and there was a question about the long-term viability. Losing money on an operating basis, and the capital needs were quite intense. And so the decision was given to reach an outside party who thought they could provide some of the capital, that they could run it on a profitable basis. And that was the carrot for them, after all, that they could run it on a profitable basis. And so they could solve a problem for us while having gain for them. That was when ICI came in, 2004 time period. Um, with a business model that was explicit about using it for Northwest Arkansas, which is underserved in terms of landfills. Okay, and then just one final question. Have we made a decision whether to enforce the contract with ICI? In other words, we've been left holding the bag. Is anyone going to be sued over this mess? I would say that the Attorney General could give you a more definitive answer than me. I think the issue is that we have to consider, at least, is um, just the pros and cons of that. What's the likelihood of recovery? What assets are in there? What legal theory we pursue You know, underneath that? So I would say that um, Ms. Hammonds can probably offer an opinion about that, and she'll be the person who leads that particular fight, too, Councilman. Councilman Baker? Yeah, uh, Brad, and, and I'm, I'm not questioning what you said, but I recall that we used to make money at the landfill. And uh, we didn't make a lot of money because we were carrying the, the chicken houses and some of the tree operations and, and all that. Doug, do you have those numbers? I've seen the numbers for the early 2000s in which on a, we made a little bit of money and then on an operating basis toward the end of, before ICI's era, on an operating basis, there was, it was negative of that. It was all marginal. We're taking 100, 200 tons a day, roughly, in a very volume-driven okay. volume driven business. Um, <coughs> but as I recall, before taking in Arkansas's garbage, we were still employing a dozen people. We were still helping the Delaware County, Adair County, Cherokee County with disposal of their solid waste. And uh, and I think we were maybe being better stewards of, of the uh, uh, ecology. I mean, I just... I mean, it had a purpose. It created some jobs, and it was covering expenses of other operations that were not making money. And uh, and as I recall, we started telling people that we were running out of land space. We were doing this. We were doing that. And two or three of our local guys or uh, cities pulled, pulled out. And that's when ICI came in to to give us this $3 million up front and go forth and prosper and come up with the uh, closure monies and and all such as that. And so I guess I'm a little concerned that they weren't paying into the closure fee because the engineers were saying that there was enough money in there already. I think you raised a number of issues about that. I've seen the numbers from the early 2000s, and it <clears throat> off and on, but it was it was marginally profitable in the best of years, and it had reading in lesser years. I think the issue when ICI came in was that we were running out of space. So there had to be a seven-figure infusion of cash to open up a new cell. And so who was going to put that money into it? Was it worth us to do that? Can you justify that kind of capital infusion for the small amount of trash that we were accepting at the time. So I think there's a lot of issues there. Um, and then, of course, the issues about ICI and whether they paid into the closure fund or not. There's certainly our belief they didn't pay adequately into the closure fund. That is true. 
I think the issue going forward is we're now presented with a dilemma where we have no space left. It's going to require you know, a three to seven million dollar investment to open up a new cell. Excuse me, just a second. No. Yeah. Yeah, I have the I have the audits from 1995 up to 2007, and and uh, I was or 2006, and then the 2007 pre-closed numbers. Uh, what I did is put the uh, <coughs> the audited numbers for cash, restricted cash, which the restricted cash is tied to the closure liability, the uh, property plant and equipment, the amount we capitalized, and then the liabilities and the net income and accumulated earnings for each year. So are you, your, your, your question specifically was geared toward profitability, correct? Correct. Um, how far back do you want me to go? Well, if you got it there from 95 forward, just do it. When did the curve turn? Well, the first year we operated in a deficit at the landfill was 2004, and we've operated in a deficit every year since then. The 95 is $284,000 net income. 96, a million hundred one thousand net income. 97, 299,000 net income. 98, basically, was a break even. 99, a 30,000 net income. 2000 was 449,000 net income. 2001, 693,000 net income. 2002, 850,000 net income. 2003, 217,000 net income. And 2004 was a deficit or a loss of 466,000. 2005 was 260,000 net loss. 2006 was a 338,000 net loss. And the unaudited numbers when I pulled them off of our system a week or so ago was $347,000 net loss for 07. Now, in those numbers, these are all audited numbers except for the 07, it appears uh, some of these net income numbers in the past could be somewhat uh, uh, overstated to a degree of however much the undepleted capitalized cost was not charged off on the income statement. In other words, when we have a fixed asset and we, um, we buy a, a piece of equipment and we may depreciate it over a 10-year life, then a tenth of that on straight-line depreciation gets charged to our income statement every year because we, we don't expense it the year we buy it, we expense it over 10 years. Same thing when you expend $3 million to create airspace, except that's called depletion. Now, the site development costs and the PP&E grew upwards to $6.1 million by 2005, end of year. Well, it's still holding roughly $5 million in it now. <clears throat> but yet there's no airspace. So, and, and the treasurer, uh, Ms. Catcher, has already reported to the body, I believe in the last finance committee, that she's going to have to take it a hit to the P&L of the landfill for $4.8 million <coughs> because there's an asset on the books that has no future revenue generating capacity. A portion of that 4.8 was pre-ICI. And a portion, a portion was after that. So when you look at these income numbers throughout the years, um, when you have to compare when was the capitalization to create the airspace and when was it actually consumed? Now, I have one question for uh, Mr. Carson that I'm kind of trying to understand in, in my mind. The, these audits all uh, were derived by independent auditors that obtained engineering reports at the end of each fiscal year that was calculating uh, some formula. I'm not, a, I'm not an engineer, uh, so I, uh, it, it's a formula that determined, based on our capacity that we've consumed, how much 
closure, post closure liability, similar to a pension fund, would have a, a funding obligation um, that we needed to book on our balance sheet. And I'm, I'm struggling uh, in my own mind trying to understand how 600,000 tons in the last two years would take our closure obligation from two. Roughly two million, two and a half million, up to twelve to twenty. Sure. And I, I'm not uh, for just for my own benefit. Absolutely. Not, I can answer that for you. The body may understand, but I'm still trying to understand that. Um, I think the issue is, I would make two points. If I can respond to your first observation, you know, I've opined about engineering and law, and I don't do either of those. So let me try to opine about the accounting there too, which is to say, if you sum up the last ten years of net income he gave there. They're less than a couple million bucks, probably total. And there's $5 million of depreciation that wasn't taken. That should have been. It would have wiped all that out. That's the way it, to sum that, I think, what you're saying. But if properly accounted for, there would have been, you know, um, you take all those across there, a massive multi-million dollar deficit, I think it's safe to say, from a proper accounting of the way the landfill was run. But to answer your question, it goes to this notion of an abrupt closure. When you're running a landfill and you're putting trash into it every day, you're not expecting that tomorrow it's going to be announced you close it down. And so it's pitched at a particular angle sometimes, an angle that's supposed to be an interior slope, which is perfectly legal to be an interior slope, but is not permissible under EPA rules to be an exterior slope. Well, if you decide all of a sudden we're going to close it today, that once interior slope, which perhaps is at a higher grade, is now the exterior slope because that becomes the bounds of your landfill. So the first thing you have to do is you have to lower that grade to where it can become an exterior slope. That is a, the perhaps most serious problem presenting itself with the landfill, a problem that suggests itself of only two alternatives. You're either going to have to dig another big hole to lower that grade, or you're going to have to cart off the excessively steep grade to another landfill entirely both of which are multi-million dollar issues. And there are other matters attendant to that, but that's fundamentally the issue, is you start making a landfill, and for what was supposed to be the interior of the landfill, if we abruptly abort the project and it becomes the exterior, well, that's no longer permissible, and the costs are going to go up dramatically as we try to paper around it to make the proper closure. And I would again suggest three engineering firms have all suggested that's exactly the issue and why the costs are... Can I see that? Absolutely. We're happy to provide the engineering for us here, Um One other thing. The, uh, um, I've, I've heard different uh, comments about the regulations and the compliance and the EPC versus federal EPA. Do or Is this a mandate of the federal government that we fund this closure post-closure, or is this a mandate of the EPC? It's a EPA-driven mandate about how you fund the closure. And it's actually, as I understand it, in the Code of Federal Regulations, they have a, uh, a formula for how you uh, calculate these things. Okay. It's under both. You know, basically, uh, and perhaps Callie and others can talk about how the EPC was formed to do these kind of things. But we are not immune from, say, Subtitle D regulations of RECRA, which governs this policy altogether. The EPC supplants some of that. Um, but not all of it, and it's plant some of the state regulations that might otherwise exist, but federal regulation is still upon us, and there are people may, who can speak perhaps to the intersection of those better. Okay. If, if we were to, if we would have um, presumed that this sale that just filled up was our last sale, if we had anticipated going into this that this is our last sale, mm -hmm. then that's that 600,000 ton in the last couple of years that filled it up, would have required the 12 million closure. No, if we knew, if we had been planning for the closure all along, as opposed to building out more right. cells, I would suggest, and I think the engineers would say this, although I'm, I'm channeling them a bit on this, that the closure would be much less. It'd be you know a couple million bucks, three million bucks, for what the closure would have been if we'd been planning all along that this was right, that that was the end of the landfill. It's because we didn't, and we cut it off in the middle of things that really all hell has broken loose in terms of what the closure costs are going to be. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I, I guess then uh, to follow up, uh, would it be uh, CMB's long-term 
goal or short or long term goal to run this landfill to close it, or is it to, uh, you know, like I said, are, are we going to be building new cells with the idea that this is going to be our last sale, or are we going to continue to to, to open up uh, cell after cell? And, and, and then I have a follow up after that. Sure. I mean, I think the various proposals that have been unveiled by the engineering firms that have looked at it suggest we're between a rock and a hard place, if you will. Which is to say, to open up another cell is going to cost, in the estimates, are three million to seven million dollars. So, to justify that kind of capital investment up front, you have to have a certain flow. That, if properly permitted, can be a landfill that lasts 20 years. There's another alteration in permitting that could expand the life of the, of the landfill to 50 years. Well, we're going to need to probably, if you choose the option of running it, run it for a couple of decades at a minimum to justify and get money into the closure fund that can pay off all of these kind of things and get to a point where you have everything going and where you've justified that initial capital investment of $7 million, let's say, to get $20 million, to get uh, the 20-year lifespan on it. So that's the trick we're in. There's no easy, cheap options out of it. And the option that is cheapest is no doubt to continue to run it. But to continue to run it is to make a commitment that you know to pay itself off, to generate funds for the closure fee, it's going to be a multi, multi-year <coughs> project, without doubt. Jody, this question Hall. Yes. <coughs> First off, if CMB takes over the landfill, the rest of it, do we as the tribal council have any input? And how much input would we have? Because it sounds like to me that you're saying we want to keep taking out straight trash. And Joe and I are from Adair County, and I'm telling you straight up, we don't want to take out straight trash. I mean, I would just say I'm agnostic about the future of the landfill, truly. I'm not here saying I've got things I would like to tell you in a different form that can make more money for CNB than running a landfill in Adair County, and certainly with a lot less headache than that. So I'm not here to press the Cherokee Nation to give us the landfill. I'm saying is it is probably the best option for us, given the pickle we find ourselves in. Um, in terms of the influence, yes, of course. I mean, most of you talk to me on a frequent basis. Three of you are members of our advisory group. I'm here a couple of times a month to do that, and I'm happy to meet with anyone any time about that. And so I'm happy to do that. About the Northwest Arkansas trash, again, there's no easy answers here. You know, I would suggest that probably, um, you know, if the nation wants to pony up 12 to $20 million to close it down imminently, then you know, that is a decision really for you to make, not for me to make. But that is the commitment that people are going to be asking of you. Um, to pay it off, to avoid that kind of expenditures, you're going to have to take Northwest Arkansas trash because that's where the revenue comes from. Okay. Like I said, once again, I'll reiterate, Ader County does not want to take any on-state trash. So can you start looking at your studies other ways besides out-of-state <coughs> trash, whether we have to buy people wood or what, because Adair County does not want out-of-state trash anymore. I understand. So please, please start looking at something like that. I, believe, I would suggest to you there is, those are your, it's a binary choice for you, Councilwoman. We can market to Northwest Arkansas, which is a booming market and a lucrative one, or we can choose to pay 12 to $20 million to shut it down. Again, I'm not here to advocate. I'm agnostic about those choices, but those are the ones that do confront you. Okay, I got a question. Who is billing the customers? Us or ICI? Billing the city of Fayetteville and others? All of them. Okay. In the past? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Cali can perhaps talk about this. ICI was billing, billing the customers, is my understanding of that. Correct. Off Wasteworks? Yes. Who bought Wasteworks? Who's it licensed to? Us or ICI? It is licensed to Cherokee Nation. We Did still own that product. Do you? Did they we allowed them to utilize our system, yes. Okay. We had already purchased the, um, the software several years ago. So we're looking into the winter like 14, anywhere from 14 to $2,100 a day for the trash for uh, If that was to be 14, it would be 21 I'm speculating a bit, but I don't think those numbers are unreasonable. Or in terms of, I think, they're, I think you're generally accurate in putting those numbers together, yes. Okay. I don't know if this is for county or Doug. How much equity of Cherokee people's, how, many, how much Cherokee people's money have we lost so far? That I can go back and tell my constituents in Adair County, I'm sorry we lost this much for you folks. Poof, it's gone. Well, the only way I can answer that is looking at the current financial position right now. And depending on what the determination is made going forward, 
um, there's there's going to be a, a, a posting of a transaction to close out 2007 that Callie's already reported to you that's approximately a $4.8 million hit. There's not $4.8 million in retained earnings. There's at the end of 06 there was 2.9, but there was a $350,000 loss this year. So we're going to start with 2.6. That's what can absorb a 4.8, 4.8 million dollar expense. We can absorb it through our equity, but it's going to exceed even our equity by a little over 2 million. That that write-off, what that means is. If your equity didn't fund the capital expenditure to begin with, something else did. Loans. Okay, so now we've got outstanding debts that are sitting on the balance sheet with no asset to generate to pay the debt back, so it's a negative equity. Okay. That's Gen Fund and CNE. That's that's who the that's who the financiers of this CapEx was. And uh, that's who I mean fortunately I say fortunately, um, not not in, in light, but it's not external third party lenders. Um, does that answer your question, Mr. Yes. Hall? Yes, uh, Council, so, yeah. Mr. Carson, does the uh, price tag that you uh, estimated for the, the closure of the facility, $12.3 million, does that include the uh, carrying through the Fayetteville contract to full term? No. Okay, so that's an additional, what would you tell me, it's five years to, to, or seven? Four more years? Four more years. So that's, what, what was that equate to? Another $10 million on top of that that we would have to? I, I mean, it, 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 sure. Okay. Uh, we'd obviously try to find ways to mitigate the losses right. involved with that. Trying to get perspective. Yeah, if we continue down with the status quo, as we're doing today. That, that these costs, a certain amount of these costs, the decision is made two years ago, or the decision is made eight years from now to close this facility. Those costs are have to be incurred. So, is it possible to uh, for you to break out that cost and say? What is the impact of this additional mound of uh, trash going to cost us? Because that's really what you know determines uh, what we've essentially lost. You know, because right. we, we're about to pay the cost of closure anyway. To say we all wake up tomorrow and we say, you know, let's close the landfill at at Steelville. That cost is going to incur regardless. So the decision of you know, is the is the cell full or whatever? I don't think that that impacts as much as you know. What is the, the difference between this hauling off or additional resources to um, come into compliance with the proper closure? I'll be happy to try to model that for you, Councilman. Councilman Hoskins. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, at our last meeting, there was some discussion of ICI being in arrears concerning, I think, host fees is the appropriate term. And I guess my question would go to Ms. Ketcher. Can you update us as to any collection efforts concerning, if I've got the terminology correct? I, I, there's a set of funds out there we're trying to recoup. So. Right. Um, we have continued to bill ICI for the operating expenses. Um, I would assume this is going to end up in litigation at some point. Uh, the only payment we have received since our last meeting is the City of Fayetteville check, which we put in our bank account and applied to the debt. And that, that check we received was for what had been um, billed through September 30th when the, uh, before the landfill closed. And is, it, is it in the uh, Attorney General's yes. area to yes. use her discretion as to whether to... We have, I've been working with the Attorney General and providing all the documents and um, I can't, I can't tell you where we stand on that. I just know that uh, she is working on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, the closure <coughs> obligation, is that something that covers um, monitoring and uh, testing and and things to ensure 10, 20, 30 years from now that 
Uh, nothing leaked. When I said 12 to 22 million. Does it include those costs? So what you're asking? Yes. Yes. It does. Is, is that what kind of that cost represents? So we can the understand bulk, what closure really means. The bulk of the cost is the initial capping of it. You have to put <coughs> cover on it and okay. you know sediment and, and the grass, if you will, and these kind of liners and stuff over the top of it. So um, that's the bulk of it. There is what they call a post-closure obligation, which goes on for 30 years or longer. That's where the monitoring, monitoring and right, okay. methane and groundwater and surface water issues. Is, is, do we know how much of that potential 12 million uh, is required, but it's required, you know, up to 20, 30 years from now? I mean, where an annual fund <coughs> amount could kick into play versus 12 million funding appropriation out of the body all at once. Right. How much is the minimum annual funding obligation for the first say or do we have a table that could that could draw that picture where if the body chose to close it, <coughs> what would they be looking at in minimum funding obligations each year? Not all at once, but uh, because I assume you could fund it over the course of the monitoring period to a certain right. degree. Um, as I recall, I'll be happy to share the engineering reports with you and the council if they would like to look at that where they break it down in rather technical fashion. Um, as I recall, the least expensive option was the $12 million. And I believe about two-thirds of that, 8 or $9 million <coughs> up front, okay. first-year costs, I see. and the rest of it. The monitoring costs are relatively insignificant <coughs> compared to the cap. It's way up front because of that cover. Right, exactly, okay. exactly. That's <coughs> okay. Brian McCobb. <coughs> this is, uh, I know this was pre Brad Carson, so this may be more for uh, Callie, if Callie's in here, but um, this is not to put anyone on the spot, but this is to, I'm going to be asked as a council person to make a decision, to use your word, the, the pickle that we're in. Um, I'm a business owner, there are a lot of business owners on this council. And most of the people on this council are used to looking at numbers. And I'm having a really hard time swallowing the fact that looking at monthly, quarterly, or yearly profit loss statements that all of a sudden in 04, <coughs> boom, we lost $450,000 and somebody didn't say, wait a minute, I, I, I am having a hard time swallowing the fact of how that information was presented because as a business owner if we're going along and all of a sudden we get to 04 and we've lost $450,000 I'm going to raise my hand and there are some intelligent business people on this council and there were in the last council so I'm my dilemma is I'm going to be asked to make a decision about something and I need to know what those numbers I don't need the spend, I need to know what those numbers actually are. Because, you know, if I see four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I've got a lot of questions. So that's that's the dilemma that I'm in. I've got to make a decision and I've got to know exactly what these numbers are. So I think that that's the, I, I don't I wasn't here in 04, I don't know, but that's really kind of where my line of thinking is going. I think I can somewhat address your question of what was happening at the landfill in 03, 04, and 05. Um, end of 2002, we talk about where we're at today and we're, quote, in a pickle. We were in a pickle in 2002. Um, there was a, an actual investigation and the landfill manager was fired. Uh, there was an issue of trash being put off the liner. That was well documented. So there was a lot of capital investment made in 2003-2004, while at the same time, volumes dropped. Um, I think in 2002, the landfill was taking upwards of 1,000 tons a day. 2003-2004, that dropped down to around four to 500 tons a day. And as Brad mentioned earlier, the landfill business is a volume-driven business. Um, and I think, realistically, that was part of the motiv motivation for looking for an outside operator, which is the agreement we entered into in 2005, was to find a partner who was 
willing to put the capital into it and the nation you know, make us whole in terms of environmental liabilities and the nation would basically reap the rewards in terms of a host fee. Best laid plans, but that was the thinking back in those early years. So it was I don't think that anyone was ignoring those losses back then. That's the the operation that we had at that time. We didn't have enough volume to turn a profit. Well, so it, it comes back to you gotta weigh your options if you're gonna if you're gonna go forward. Well, what I would request is that is kind of similar to what uh, Councilman So requested is that coming from the business world, I need all of the data. And when, like he asked the federal contracts, I, I need to know. Um, you know, I have a tendency to kind of look at the bigger picture, and I need to see, you know, really what those options are. So when those are presented, I need to know all the numbers. Mm -hmm. I need to know everything. And I know a lot of this was before you were here, but, but. Um, and what I can commit to both you and Councilman Soap and anyone else is if you have specific questions like this, let me make sure I'm clear on them and I will provide that and get that data calculated for you where, uh, where you can have the answers you need on that. Thank you. I don't have anything. Councilman Crendon. You have Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Carson, is the city of Stillwell still taking the leachate water? My understanding is that yes is the answer to that. <coughs> and, and are they charging us or, or is the trade off? It's a trade-off. They take the we take the sludge, and they take the leachate. Well, could I go ahead with something? Sure. Uh, nowhere in this discussion of, of, of late have, has anybody talked about the people who live around the landfill, the folks that are downstream. I mean, we've got this from A and M Engineering here that says there's no difference above the landfill, below the landfill. You know, I, I mean, it's, I, I'm not, I don't know about that. You know, I would like to know for sure uh, some type of a study or something uh, while we're in, idling along here is what I'm getting at. Uh, and according to what Doug said while ago or the figures he gave us, for about 10 years, we may have lost some money, but we lost it a much uh, uh, less, you know, Amount than we did in you know, starting in 05. So, uh, like Jody said a while ago, if we're going to reopen the landfill, and we were told that the other day, we went to a meeting, <coughs> that we could put some liner on the ground in 60 days. Put some, sorry, some liner some on the liner on the ground in about 60 days and be receiving. Leapfrog. Huh? Leapfrog. Yeah, leapfrog it and, put, and be receiving trash if we chose to do that. But, I would like to reiterate again that I I don't think we'll approach this thing as a the last two years has not shown me that this is a really money making proposition, especially if we have a partner. Uh, we may not have been duped. I've got another word for it. Uh, it's not exactly duping what I had in mind, but uh, uh, but anyhow, uh, I'd like to see us restrict the trash. To like four counties or to our 14 counties maximum. And I'm more concerned with the Arkansas folks downstream from the landfill than I am the ones in northwest Arkansas as far as this contract is concerned. Honestly, I don't think we've got an obligation in this contract. And that's just my, my feelings about the Thank you, Mr. Chair. I got a question here. We're running late here. <coughs> I'd like to close the debate or the discussion in, in five minutes. Okay. okay. I have requested that Sharon Swepson and Doug Bain be here today. Uh, they wasn't here, and I'm okay for closing this debate because we have other meetings. But on the day that there's an executive finance meeting at the end of this month, I want this council to let that men know that I want to and that we're, we missed the EPC meeting last month. It was canceled. This is such a hot topic. I don't see why it was canceled. I don't know why it was not rescheduled. And I want them to hear to answer the question. I don't. So if we want to recess, if we want to recess, that's fine. 
as long as we can pick back up on the day of executive time. What is the committee think? I second that motion. You second the motion. Your motion. You made a motion, you second. We'll have a discussion on it. Mr. Chair? Yes. I, I'm okay with recessing, but to when, did you say? The day of the executive finance meeting? The 29th. The 29th. So is that only to see Sharon Swetson and to and uh, Doug Bain? No, it's to continue this meeting that we're cutting short. Okay, but on what basis? I'm just curious for the public. I mean, we need to know what's the intention. Because if we're just all going to sit here, I probably can, and this can be had elsewhere. Uh, but if we're just dialoguing to put more information in the newspapers, then no. But if we're here to make action, take action, then we need to let the public know. So, is there any newspapers here? Or <coughs> there are a couple of here. Donna Hales, Susan Ruckman, sit right behind me. Uh, so now we had a motion. We had a second. Discussion. Discussion. Uh, if, if that's a motion to recess, could we wait till we're done? Could, could we could we move that to the end? We've got we've got five pieces of legislation that really needs to go to council, and 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 so uh, I really don't want to just recess the meeting and, and not take care of this other business. Move to table yeah. motion till the end of the meeting. And second that. Take, take your motion to the end of the meeting. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I. Uh, if we're in new business, I'd like to make a motion that we pass that. We pass that motion. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, we got a motion. To table. To table. To the end of the meeting, yeah. Second. <laughs> second. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? <coughs> Let's go to new business. Resolution authorized the act. If, if, if I could. Sure. Could, if, if, could we pass items one through? As the sponsor, I would love to do that. Okay. <laughs> I said sure. chair. I'm sorry. Chair. Thank you. Um, if the committee would, would be okay with it, I would like to pass, make a motion to pass items one, two, three, four, and five, which includes Braggs, Holbert, OK, Redbird, and Vianne communities. And the, the resolutions are just to change ownership of the grant from Cherokee Nation businesses to the Cherokee Nation. IS department or IT department in order to facilitate broadband wireless access for those five communities. Second. Second. On favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed. What's the purpose of the transfer? They no longer have the capacity to facilitate the actual uh, implementation of those grants so we because Cherokee. Cherokee Nation businesses no longer has Cherokee Nation Connects, which was the business entity that would have put the wireless towers in place. So Cherokee Nation IS department under Todd Inlow does have that expertise and ability to facilitate the contracts for wireless towers to be constructed and broadband implemented. Mr. Hoskins. And the communities that have been identified, they were already in place, this is this this isn't this doesn't affect what communities were in place, right? Yes, to my knowledge, this is the existing plan. We are just changing ownership of the grant money under those that was the application made for USDA rural broadband. Thank you. For more discussion, and we'll vote on this. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? And we'll go down to uh, Resolution 6. Resolution of the Commission of a Comprehensive and Independent Environmental Study of the Cherokee Nation Land in <coughs> County. I move for its approval. Uh, Second, with a friendly amendment. Okay. I but I thought we had other sponsors, so. Um, it needs to 
not are we on the one that's in the packet or are we on the one that's in that's been handed out to us? Then I think that it needs to be removed that where it says through its tribal council and by the tribal council because we do not execute anything. I've got two questions. Well, maybe three. Do and Mr. Carson's gone. Do we have a do we have any how much did this cost? I have no idea. Let me see if I can Did you accept that friendly amendment, Mr. Chair? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did. Um, chair can't make a motion and it was actually Jody Fishinghawks and Joe Creighton's uh, sponsorship and I think they probably ought to have a chance to speak to it before any motions made on it whatsoever but that's just my opinion <coughs> Joe would you comment on resolution 6 uh, Mr. Chairman yes I got a question first. I'm going to let her. How long has INM Engineering I been involved in the land bill? I still have the floor, I think. Okay. And they hadn't answered my point of order yet. Uh, yeah. So I mean. Okay. Mr. Chair, I will res I would respect, I will withdraw my second so that the sponsors can make the motion, too. <coughs> if you want to withdraw your motion. I didn't. I believe Mr. Yeah. The chair made yeah. the motion would be yeah. King's X at this point. Okay. Uh, I, I, I apologize. I had stepped out. We're on uh, the orders of the day is uh, resolution number six. Uh, the practice is to allow uh, a, a the sponsor or the author uh, explanation. Then there is a motion to accept following the second, and then at that point there would be discussion. So if we want to back up, what I would ask the chairman to do is recognize either uh, Ms. Fishinghawk or Mr. Crittenden for an author's explanation that that time there would be a motion for approval, and if it receives a second, then you go into discussion, and then you would recognize um, uh, Dr. Cobb, who uh, had the full order first. Okay, so we need to... Uh Back off the motion, did you say? I would say that with all the motions that were withdrawn, if we had the privilege of Mr. Cobb, Dr. Cobb, who did have the floor, if he would relinquish the floor, uh, I, I would ask that the uh, authors be recognized. I would relinquish that to the authors. Okay. Ms. Christian Hall. I have a question. How long has any of the engineering been involved with the landfill? Um, it, I came in 2004, and well before that. Well before 2004. Okay, because our resolution is asking it be conducted by a formal organization with high qualifications and without prior contacts, or we may add contracts with the nation. And AMN has been with them before 2004, so it's had prior contacts. <coughs> I believe they were involved in 98 when I came to the Church Nation. That long? Yes, ma'am. We've contracted it. Yeah, I, I've been here since uh, 93. Around. They've used several contractors, but I know the A&M has, has been used previously in the past uh, 
in the preceding 98 okay. delivery. So they've been around for quite some time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I said the question was asked. We pay a them about eighty to ninety thousand dollars a year, roughly, for testing. So that's the kind of range people are talking about if you're doing uh, tests like this. That's was a the firm engineering company in Mexico that the chief told me he was having a look at it also. PBSNA, Daniel B. Stevens and Associates, they have looked at it. They didn't do environmental testing, but they are one of the engineers I mentioned that has done. Uh, have they had contact with the nation before contracted with us? I'm sorry? Have they contracted with the nation before or CNE, CNI? We've CNB contracted. Okay, they have. They've had contact with us this one more time. No, no, no. <coughs> Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, as it says down the second paragraph from the bottom, it says, Environmental study be conducted by a firm or organization with high qualifications and without prior contract portable board act with the Cherokee Nation. We we need a motion on the floor before we can have this discussion. So well, everybody, motion to approve. Everybody's withdrew the motions. Yeah. That's right. Okay, I'll I'll make a motion to approve. You can make a motion to approve. I hear a second. I'll second it. Okay, I'm gonna hear some discussion. There you go. All right. Thank you. There's no discussion on this. Let's be ready to vote on it. All in favor say aye. Oh, no. oh. 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 Dr. Cobb. That's okay. Um, I'm not inherently opposed to an environmental study. I mean, I completely understand. My question is, what do you hope to gain from another independent source doing an environmental study that's not already in here. I, mean, I guess my question is, is it trust these people? Is it you just want a second opinion? Is it that that's my question of why a different environmental study? Can I respond to this? Uh, my own personal way, I, just an independent study. I think the environmental issues. Someone that hasn't been hired before. <laughs> right. I mean, that way it takes it totally out of, uh, you know, out from under the umbrella, if you will, or whatever. And, uh, I mean, we, we put a statement out here, or there's a statement been made that our landfill is under new management, or was, and is permitted, licensed, and compliant with all federal regulations regarding environmentally sound landfills. I would like to know that as a, as a resident of Adair County, that we're accepting trash into this place if we open it back up, and that it is environmentally as friendly as possible for our people and those downstream. And that's the only reason, Mr. Cobb. I, I would... The other part of that is, um, before we vote yes or no, I would like, and I know we're paying A and M quarterly. I would like to know just what we're spending. With A and M, it's it's sixteen to twenty thousand dollars a quarter. So to to have, and I would yield. I mean, to have one of these done, any kind of cost estimate. I, I would say, and again, I'm speculating a bit. Perhaps twenty thousand dollars. Again, I'm, I am speculating. Mr. Stoltz. Yes, what's, what's the definition of comprehensive? What are we... Water, land, I want a total carbon. I mean, are you talking about, are you talking pH, or are you talking all these other... Uh, pH is ...checks for chemicals that are leaching out of the landfill? Are you talking about PM issues, or... Or what, what's comprehensive actually? What's your target? The other question is: Is how long do you expect this target study to last, or this comprehensive study to, to last? Air, water, and soil. I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not sure. I know how long it would last, but right now uh, I have no clue what's going on down there. I mean, from a from a technical standpoint, I don't know. I mean, there's lots of concern down there about what's going on as far as environmental issues. <coughs> and, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, we can talk dollars and we can worry about how much revenue we're making. Uh, like I said, we, we talk very little about our people's uh, health and welfare down there. They live around that thing. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to live down that close to it and have a well for my water source. Uh, there's just a lot of concerns. And that's why I would like to see this done. Mr. Baker. Yeah, and, and in all reality, we're looking at a landfill that we're going to be asked to, to vote on 12 to $20 million to shut down or $7 million 
to build another cell and continue taking trash. And it's like Joe said, you know, this is trust property with a re- or not a, with with allotments all around this place, and and it drains right down to Salazar, and and the I mean they sit there and say everything's hunky dory, but yet our own EPA has given a million some dollars in fines because some ain't right, and I just think that. For us to make logical, good decisions, we need somebody to report it to us and tell us exactly what's going on. And if, we're, if it's going to kill people, then $20 million is cheap. And if, it's, if it, everything's running, running good, then, then maybe the, the deal is to operate it uh, with, with closure in sight. Uh, but we don't know. And not, there's nobody at, the, at these tables that I would consider an expert in, in landfills. And, uh, and I just I think this council deserves an independent view so that we can make a good decision for the people in Adair County, for the people in Sequoia County, and for the people at your houses. Thank you. Councilman Fulbright. At last, I get to speak. <laughs> I think we need an independent study. I represent the people down on Eastern Square County. Very many people have come by my house and told me they were so glad the landfill was closed. They did not want to be open. I don't know how we got to where we are now. It's the very number that 12 to $20 million is going to take to close it. But when you add what it's going to take to cost to build a new cell, and then you keep adding all this more trash in there from Northwest Arkansas, how much is it going to cost way later on? I like to say, we live down below it, <coughs> and people down in Savoy County do not want to reopen. I want to see a totally independent study done. Mr. Commission Office, you have your Yes, I do. I don't care if we pick out somebody to do it that's independent. Uh, since Brad brought up that we're federally regulated by the closure fund, I don't care if we ask the federal government and the EPA to come in to do this. I think the money that it's going to cost to do this is nothing compared to healthy kids and healthy lives. Matter of fact, I brought a couple of gallons of well water today from three different homes that's right next to the land people. And if anybody thinks the water down there is okay to drink, would you please have a drink of it? And would you please take it home to your kids and let them drink it? Because it's out in the car, folks. Mr. Cobb, you're up. If we are going to do this, and I, if if uh, Council Councilor Soap has any anything, I would yield some of my time to him. Um, we both are in the biology degree department. But um, if we're going to do this. What I see here is pH, specific inductance, barium, chloride, magnesium, nitrate, and sulfate. I would like to identify, uh, I'm going to have to find someone to do this. I would like to identify the top five carcinogens um, in the U.S. Um, I'm assuming benzene and and the PCB and some of those are going to be on there. If we're going to do this, I want the top five carcinogens also tested. I'd like PCBs in there because we can take the synthos clothing manufacturer. Most of the PCEs can be in there. Thank you. If we're just going to close down the landfill, why are we spending all this money? I mean, if that's what I'm hearing, then why are we going to spend it? I mean, there's there's a different kind of test. There's different methodologies if we're going to go for closure versus (laughs) maintaining, keeping it open, and then closing it. Just throwing that out there if we're going to have all this. Councilman Frischenhoff, you're up. I want it done whether it's open or whether it's closed. I want to do so I can answer to my Cherokee people in your County. We had a vote on the motion two hours ago. <laughs> that was a, a, a no, I, I think I mentioned in my statement that was a friendly amendment. I would accept that friendly amendment. <laughs> I still have a question of who determines what the comprehensive study is. Is it, <coughs> is it you or is it EPC? Is it chief? 
who determines that through this piece of legislation? So we're, we're going to select. The, the, we're going to select the criteria on which we want the study to be conducted, and then we will determine when it's finished, and then somebody will publish it. This is the, the engineering firm, assumably, that's going to be doing it. I'd certainly like to see the results of it published, if you will. I mean, after all, it's uh, it's for the good of the public. So. Council President, uh, who's going to determine what company does this? Council. Uh, <coughs> you want the council to do it? Yes. You want Brad to do it? Or okay. Who wants to take on that responsibility? Me. Not me. Yeah. Not me. Not me. <laughs> Council Council. going to have to make a decision, but we need to get someone to to take that. Responsibility. I would like to make the motion that we strike through its tribal council and the by the tribal council because it should be the chief's responsibility or his designee. That is not a friendly amendment. That's a motion. I'll second that. I'm sorry. With so it would be that we're going to, to strike through its tribal council in the first now, therefore be it resolved. Strike through its tribal council and then by the tribal council. This is a motion to amend the current motion on the table, which is to accept as written, and I don't believe it should be. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, that is correct. This is a subsidiary motion to the main motion on the floor, which is to pass the resolution as is. Uh, she has made a motion which is appropriate at this time, and it has received a second. So, therefore, the debate would now be germane to Ms. Kellen Watts's motion to strike by the Tribal Council. Um, yeah. Just, just strike that and just be so it would read that a comprehensive environmental study be commissioned to study all aspects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the motion is to strike the underlying portion in the uh, uh, resolution that you have before you. Councilman Hoskins. Yeah, it seems to me, Mr. Chairman, that we ought to not bring Councilman Watson in. I think this, I think, ought to be appropriately the council's commission study. Um, you know, we certainly want to take politics out of deciding who the firm is, but just because we make the ultimate decision, Mr. Chairman, that who the firm is doesn't mean we can't ask Congressman uh, Carson or the EPC for their input. I mean, they certainly have expertise. They can make recommendations. We can make the final decision by vote. I mean, presumably, the administration would be relying on the AN engineering report, and we can look at that too, but I think it's very appropriate that we pass the resolution as is, so that's the tribal council's uh, <coughs> study. So I would urge us to oppose uh, Council Council's uh, motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I want to see this environmental study done. We've got two different types of bacteria running in the Illinois River right now. We need to check to make sure they're not over there water. But I don't see anything constitutional wise, uh, uh, yes, sir, to keep us from, to keep the council from doing this uh, comprehensive environmental study, do you? The way I would interpret that, that this is a resolution, this is not a legislative act. This is more on the line of fact finding mission. You all are going to be asked to make major decisions about this. Uh, th this uh, uh, landfill, and it's my understanding that they, that the uh, the sponsors of this uh, resolution wanted uh, to get to get to gather information for the council by the council, and and uh, in my opinion, it, it would not be a, a, a conflict between the uh, powers of government. Thank you. I'm sorry, I just. I had to just say one thing, well, two things, two things. First of all, the Com uh, Environmental Protection Commission has hired their own independent consulting firm, and I, their name is Aquaterra, and I would put them at your disposal, and your consultants, whoever you want to, you know, have 
end up hiring. But the other thing I was going to mention is that I think you, <coughs> based on what I'm hearing you want to look at, you may not want just an engineering firm. You may want some biologists or something, maybe more than one firm or uh, group that you want to hire. Because if you look at the stream, it's going to take longer and there's going to be biologists and it probably won't be engineers that are out there yes. looking at the wells. So. Sure. Thank you. I really believe that there should be more comprehensive study done on this topic. But none of us sitting at this table, even of us with the technical degrees, are qualified to be making the kind of decisions that would put us in front of an EPA panel or someone else testifying should this site become more than it seems to be. So I would hate the idea, I am in no way going to support being responsible for making a technical decision on something that is way far out of my own uh, technical bounds. Um, I just do not understand why this body would want to take ownership of executing, notice executive, executing the branch, when we are supposed to legislate. It's fine if we mandate that a study or comprehensive study be done, but why are we taking such personal ownership? It definitely, when we've already seen that our independent Environmental Protection Commission, which we help confirm, has also hired another one. How much Cherokee money can we spend trying to hire all these firms? I mean, if somebody has a friend they want to hire, then let's do it some other way. Let's not make this political body privy to that decision making. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilman Hobb. Or Cobb. This is an attorney question. Yes, sir. What, uh, <laughs> there, uh, when the results come in on this, what liability does the council have for those results? If we were to make a decision. Well, you don't make, well, basically you're going to be, the decision the council will make, and I would recommend that, it, that the council make a decision in the resource committee is what firm to hire, period. You know, not, not any individual. If this resolution would pass, there would be an RFP sent out, and you would come back to this committee, hire a firm. You're not responsible for the facts that the firm uh, discloses. Uh, you know, and you use that information, you know, to, to the best of your ability. So I don't think you'd have any liability uh, on that right there. Uh, we have a council meeting starting at 6 o'clock. I move this discussion close at this time. <coughs> Call for question. Can I hear a motion? So oh. the motion to amend. Uh, on information, is this a motion to cut off debate? <coughs> yes. Thank you. I didn't hear question. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'm answering Dr. Cobb's question. This is a motion to cut off debate, okay. and your answer was yes. <coughs> second. Can I hear a second? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Uh, all opposed? Motion <coughs> pass. No, for this, yeah. So now the motion to amend to remove it by the council? Yes. Uh, the motion on the, the, the vote that is appropriate at this point is a yes or no vote on whether to strike the underlying portion uh, in, uh, in the, the act that's in front of you, which states by the tribal council. So that would be. And through its tribal council up above it. And through its tribal council. Yes. So we have a motion. No, that, that was to approve the resolution. Right. The resolution as it is. We, we must settle her, her amendment first. Okay. The, the, the CARES amendment first. CARES amendment was. Up or down. To strike through its tribal council and then the, the by, by the, the tribal the council. council. Right. <coughs> motion? You have a second. Just point of order, Mr. Chairman. By voting yes, we're voting to strike by the Tribal Council, and by voting no, we're voting to leave the resolution as it is. Is that correct? Yes. 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 So we're trying to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Aye. Roll call. Roll call. <coughs> Bill England? Yes. Bill John Baker? No. Jack Baker? Yes. Harley Buzzard? Yes. Julia Coates? Yes. Brad Cobb? Yes. 
Joe Crittenden? No. Jody Fishinghawk? No. Meredith Fraley? No. Janelle Fulbright? No. Don Garvin? Yes. Chuck Hoskin Jr.? No. Tina Gloria Jordan? No. Curtis Snell? Yes. Chris Soap? Yes. David Thornton? No. Kara Callan Watts? Yes. We have nine yay, eight nay. <coughs> Call for question on the main motion. With the amendment. Move the table to start the work. Second. Is there a break? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Move the uh, motion to recess. Yes. Mm -hmm. Recess for that other other deal on the 29th. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. What time is that? Would you be directing the administration officials who are supposed to appear to appear? Because apparently they were asked to appear and have failed to appear. Yeah. We will, we will uh, address that to appear. Okay. Mr. Chair, my mind is to call your executive department. How you doing, Ginger? Is it all right? Hold on just a second. Stop. Okay, we have a motion to... Recess. Recess. So four o'clock on the 29th of the after executive finance. Second. <laughs> we had a second on the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.